What's up, guys? I'm Cy High. It is April 1st and the start of a brand new ladder season, the April ladder season. Uh, but more importantly, it is April Fool's Day, so of course you may notice the uh, googly eyes on my avatar here. Um, I don't know if that was worth the development time to implement, but uh, nevertheless, we have that now in the game, so that's cool, I guess. But uh, being that it's April Fool's Day today, we're going to take a look at a interesting, quirky, conceptual deck that may be more than just a joke meme and maybe actually has some uh, competitive potential. So if that sounds fun and cool, definitely tap that like button, subscribe if you aren't already, and let's dive in and take a look at what we're talking about. Oh, more googly eye action, that's cool. Well, what are we talking about? We are talking about cycling, a cycling deck in Historic. Yes, a cycling deck in Historic. Now, um, if you're not already familiar, just a bit of history on the cycling archetype. This was, of course, a actual serious competitive standard deck a little over a year ago. And we're mostly incorporating um, the usual suspects and the core of that deck from standard in this historic deck, which sounds pretty terrible, <laughs> but uh, no worry, don't worry. We've got some significant upgrades in historic um, cards that we can use and take a look at uh, upgrading this significantly. But uh, before we look at that, let's just talk about what the kind of the core game plan of this deck uh, used to be when it was around in standard. And I should say that when this was a deck in standard, um, it you know shared a metagame with some pretty powerful, oppressive cards and decks. So it's definitely you know, remarkable that this deck was actually a real thing. It also, um, maybe besides the mana base and a few cards that I've added, it's really cheap. There's almost no rares or uh, mythic wild cards that you need to make this deck. It's very much a budget deck. Um, so that's definitely uh, it's got that going for it. But at its core, um, this is really what it is, we'll, we'll talk about the core of what the deck is, and we'll talk about some of the weaknesses of what the standard deck had and how I'm using historic cards to try to um, take away those weaknesses and try to make this deck as competitive as it can be. But at its core, this is really a unique and interesting deck um, that attacks at weird different vectors, different angles. But the primary win condition is Zenith Flare, which is four mana, instant, Deals X damage to any target and you gain X life, where X is the number of cards with a cycling ability in your graveyard. So naturally, <clears throat> we run a ton of cycling cards in the deck where to the point where almost every card in our deck has cycling, and in that way it functions um, like a cantrip. So we can we get a ton of great inevitability in this deck, in that we get to see so many cards, we can constantly be cycling. Um, to find the right cards um, and just the inevitability of finding Zenith Flare is always there because we can cycle and get through so many cards. Um, so Zenith Flare is the primary win condition to cycle through a bunch of cards, load them up in the graveyard, and ultimately cast this when your opponent's tapped out or at their end step, um, maybe trying to force a counter spell if they have one, and maybe lining up a second Zenith Flare on your turn, on your main phase to kill your opponent. But apart from this combo plan, um, which, uh, like I've said, is your primary win condition, a lot of the cycling cards in this deck um, can kind of get the job done and um, win you the game on their, on their own uh, terms. And you kind of incidentally get these other effects and creatures along the way. So it can function as kind of a creature aggro deck, but always looming is this primary combo plan of just blasting your opponent with this big Zenith Flare. So we'll look at the other core cards that existed in the standard um, version of this deck, and then we'll cover the historic upgrades, or at least what I feel are upgrades. Um, stay tuned for later videos. I'll actually take this out on the ladder um, and see what it, how bad it is or how good it is, but I think it's got a little bit of potential for sure. And with some tweaking, we can maybe send this thing to, like, pseudo-competitive status or better. 
At least that's the hope. But uh, so covering the other cards, we start. We've got Flourishing Fox, which is one of the all-star creatures, maybe the best creature in the deck. Uh, one white, one mana drop, um, turn one. Um, oftentimes you can steal the game with this. It's a 1-1 one, one Fox. Whenever you cycle a card, you, um, the Fox gets a plus one, plus one counter, and it itself cycles for one colorless. Um, so most of the time you'll want to drop this on turn one um, and not be cycling it, um, which is hopefully pretty obvious. But a lot of times you can just steal the game with this. If they can't answer it, this guy will grow, um, as you can imagine, very quickly when we're just cycling cards. <clears throat> Uh, also at the one drop, we've got Footfall Crater, just a one red um, enchantment aura. We actually enchant a land with Footfall Crater. The enchanted land has target creature gains trample and haste until end of turn. Then, of course, the Footfall Crater also cycles for one colorless. Most of the time, all of these cycling cards, we're going to be looking um, to generally cycle them because we want to fill our graveyard, of course, as much as possible with as many cycling cards for the Zenith Flare, as already mentioned. However, Footfall Crater does have very good application and its uses um, in getting at least one on the board isn't terrible if you are going um, primarily the Flourishing Fox route in a game. If you do have foxes or a fox in play, it can definitely be pertinent to actually cast rather than cycle and resolve one Footfall Crater just because the ability to... Um, give it trample really more than anything else the haste can be relevant but it's really the trample we're talking about to once you get this uh, fo really large fox um, you don't want people just to be able to chump block him um, you want to be able to give it trample and just jam that damage um, home so that's that's the one drops we got going on again they both have cycling we also back coming over to the two drops uh, we got dranith healer one of the weaker creatures in the deck but again it cycles for one um, so, at, at, by all means, we're going to be cycling this most of the time. Um, whenever you cycle another card, you gain a life. It's a two, otherwise, it's just a 2-2 two, two Grizzly Bear. Um, not terribly exciting. However, the life gain can certainly be relevant in some matchups. Of course, maybe you're up against Red Deck Wins or a Burn Deck. And resolving this um, means that you can, even if your opponent tries to kill this in response... You may, depending on your mana base at the time, you still may be, may be able to cycle uh, several cards in response, getting very precious um, further life gain that could be huge in the matchup against very aggressive decks. So the life gain can certainly be relevant here. Um, but otherwise, uh, one of the weaker creatures, um, but it has its applications for some matchups. But uh, again, most of the time, going to be just cycling this and stick to the primary plan of killing your opponent with a Zenith Flare or multiple Zenith Flares. Moving along, we get to Valiant Rescuer. Now, this one's a little bit more interesting. It's a 3-1, but with this, um, rather than, like the Fox, we go large, but with the Valiant Rescuer, we can actually go wide, um, meaning, of course, we get a lot of creature tokens on the battlefield. In this case, whenever you cycle another card, uh, for the first time each turn, um, we get one human soldier so, of course, you can get, um, with each Valiant Rescuer, um, for each you know, turn cycle, you can get one on your turn, one on your opponent's turn. So, this is not bad. You know, it's a 3-1 that keeps generating tokens. If left unchecked for too long, this be can certainly become problematic. Um, it also has important application against one of this deck's nemesises will, of course, be... Um, Narset, as are a lot of combo decks, preventing you from drawing additional cards. Of course, is backbreaking, um, you know, for decks like the Sage God combo, which requires drawing cards. It, Narset shuts off that combo, but needless to say, it definitely shuts off um, this entire deck from cycling. But it's not the end of the world because we have these creatures and ways to kill Narset, and Valiant Rescuer is a great resource to be able to kill a problematic card like Narset because we can just try to get several tokens on the board, and Narset's not. Um, you know, it doesn't have a lot of loyalty, so we can hopefully kill it and resume uh, cycling through our whole deck. But nevertheless, Valiant Rescuer is a uh, great creature just to go wide when that is called for in a certain matchup. But if nothing else, it also cycles as well. Unfortunately, this one uh, takes two to cycle rather than one, but that's still uh, very pertinent, very viable in this cycling deck. Moving along, 
Um, we get to our last creature, I believe, in Dranath Stinger. Um, this is another 2-drop, two 2-2. Two, two. Um, this particular one, when we cycle another card, Dranath Stinger deals 1 damage to each opponent. Um, it's nice that it says it deals 1 damage to each opponent, so um, not that it's relevant that often, but it will get around things like a Ley Line of Sanctity, because it's not targeting your opponent directly. Um, of course, it also has Cycling for 1, so fits with the game plan and the synergy there in this cycling deck. Um, but Drenna Stinger can certainly be important and a way to win the game as well and just get a lot of uh, incremental damage into your opponent. Um, resolving this early, the damage really will stack up and a lot of times this does necessitate being answered uh, sooner rather than later by your opponent. And it also is just an interesting way to attack your opponent as well. It's kind of a different vector of attack to just be cycling cards, which we're already trying to do anyways, and deal a lot of damage to your opponent that way. So, Drannis Stinger was, again, another one of the core cards in this original standard archetype. Um, now that we've covered most of the cards um, in the original standard archetype, now let's get on to the exciting stuff and talk about the historic improvements. Um, but before we do, we can quickly talk about some of the weaknesses that this deck experienced in the past were that you didn't have a real natural way. Um, well, before I talk about that weakness, I, I'll talk, actually talk about a different weakness. Uh, one of the weaknesses was that um, as you're cycling through all these cards, that's all great, and you get this chain going, and you're further trying to get to Zenith Flare and that inevitability. There were certainly times where you would hit a land or running lands on the top of your deck because you didn't have a really way to filter cards. Sure, you have tons of cantrips, but sometimes there was your, your deck would just give you the finger and you know you would have a land on top followed by another land, and that just stops your chain. So you draw a land, you can't cycle the land, and you would just hit a dead end of your chaining cycling combo string. Well, all of that changes with this exciting new addition that we can run in Historic in Tectonic Reformation. Another two-drop enchantment that reads, each land card in your hand has cycling for one red. Um, and it itself also has cycling for two, which is important and good because, of course, it fits with the synergy. But moreover, this card does nothing in multiples on the battlefield. Um, there's no stacking effect. So the fact that we can cycle away additional copies is great. So we're running the full four copies of this because this is awesome. Once you get one Tectonic Reformation on the battlefield, this now means, obviously, that every single land in your deck now has cycling as well. Now, this is just huge um, for this deck because it completely turns off that pr uh, weakness I was describing earlier where... Your deck would give you the finger, and you can't control the top of your library. You'd hit a land, and you'd be stuck. That's not an issue anymore. Now you can continually cycle. Pretty much almost every single card in this deck now has cycling, or effectively has cycling with this card in play. So Tectonic Reformation is awesome, and I'm really excited to see what kind of consistency this can unlock for the deck. Um, so we've got four full copies. Uh, moving along, let's talk about the one of the other weaknesses in this deck um, was that there wasn't really a way to develop like card advantage in drawing additional cards. On your opening seven cards, you're kind of just stuck with what you have, and yeah, you can you keep cycling things, but you couldn't really generate a lot of card advantage, and that, that was that problem was exacerbated. Um, by when you would hit lands or running lands, and the deck would just, just you know, come to a brick wall and stop. But like I mentioned, that that's no longer an issue with Tectonic Reformation. But the drawing additional cards, we are going to attempt to shore that up um, using Mizex Mastery. Um, but before I talk a little bit about that, I'll just say like one of the ways some of these standard decks they would draw extra cards, they would run Boon of the Wish Giver, which um, was in a lot of these original standard archetypes. And it, of course, cycles for one, one colorless, super easy cantrip, just cycling things. So that was always great. Um, but decks would rarely be able to hard cast this. Some of the Boros versions, um, like we're running, they would actually run um, a few islands or access to blue mana. Um, 
not islands um, directly, but, you know, dual lands, at least to be able to add a little bit of blue for the chance that when they do get up to six lands um, that they could hard cast Boon of the Wishgiver um, and draw four additional cards that way to just keep the gas on the fire and keep the chain of cycling and comboing going. Now, in Historic, I have not configured this deck in a way that we are going to even bother trying to hard cast this, but uh, more powerfully... What we can do is, as we're cycling along through our deck, and we get this in the graveyard just incidentally as we're cycling through everything, we now have the all-powerful Mizex's Mastery in Historic, which, as everyone already knows by now, this is an extremely powerful card um, for enabling just busted combos um, with various ultimatums. Um, and in this deck, Mizex Mastery can do a lot of different things. We just talked about Boon of the Wishgiver. Now once we cycle Boon of the Wishgiver and it's in our graveyard, we can target it with Mizzix Mastery for only 4 mana, cast and resolve a copy of Boon of the Wishgiver um, to draw 4 cards for 4 mana, which is just a, um, an excellent rate. Um, even at sorcery speed, that's a lot of gas. It's 4 cards for 4 mana. There's not really anything equal to that, even in blue. Um, so that's great. But we also... Um, can once we've maybe used additional Zenith Flares, or even if they've been thought seized out of our hand or whatever, uh, maybe we've we've already hit our opponent's face with one. We've got extra Mizex Masteries in our hands. Now we can start copying and replay Zenith Flares from the graveyard with Mizex Mastery. In addition, with Mizex Mastery, we're also going to run four Magma Opus in the deck, which. This card has fallen out of favor a little bit in Historic, but back in the Jeskai Control days, um, now they're a little bit less popular. It's, um, you know, the format's going to a lot of Azorius Control uh, for sure. But the Jeskai Control decks would always, as I'm sure many of you already know, would run the Magma Opus Mizex Mastery combo, kind of pseudo combo, where your opponent's end step on the second turn, you discard Magma Opus, creating a treasure token, on the following turn, which is as early as, early as turn 3, you're now casting Mizzix Mastery on the all-powerful Magma Opus that normally costs 8 mana to resolve, but you're now casting it effectively for 4 mana because you're casting Mizzix Mastery, targeting, targeting Magma Opus, and resolving that as early as, as, early as turn 3. Um, that is a, definitely a very powerful move even relative to other things going on in Historic. Um, you know, it's pretty backbreaking for an aggro deck um, to go up against this sort of thing. On the third turn, to get Magma Opus, uh, you know, four damage, possibly taking out one to two or even three creatures um, on turn three, and, as well as creating a 4-4 four, four blue-red elemental and then drawing two cards, that's a huge swing on the third turn. Um, not to mention, Magma Opus um, sort of functions as a pseudo-cycling card in that we're just paying two mana to discard it and create a treasure token to enable these fast Mizex Masteries. Um, <clears throat> worth noting, though, of course, it's not as good as cycling and doesn't have the synergies with this deck um, because, of course, it doesn't actually read cycling. So it's not going to count towards your Zenith Flare cycling uh, count of cards in the graveyard nor is it going to trigger any of these things, which is unfortunate. However, I feel the just the powerful play pattern of that turn two, uh, creating a treasure token, and as er early as turn three, casting Mizex's mastery on it, is powerful enough to warrant um, these just floating around in the deck. Now, it, it, after further testing, it may become apparent that maybe this isn't the most powerful thing we could be doing. Um, but when you do do that on turn three, it is quite powerful, but I am a little concerned that it doesn't actually have cycling. Um, however, every card in this deck has cycling otherwise besides it, the, the Mastery, and the Zenith Flare itself. Um, but the, the combo of using Tectonic Reformation that the standard deck, of course, never had access to, of suddenly giving the 20 lands in our deck cycling... I think is more than enough that we can justify having these magma opuses floating around is okay because 
they're particularly devastating when you resolve them um, so early, uh, way earlier than you, any than you should, of course, because it's an eight mana spell. Um, so cheating it um, into play or cheating it to resolve much sooner with Mizzex Mastery is very powerful. So again, just to sum up, the Mizzex Mastery is um, awesome for potentially drawing four cards. You got the Magma Opus combo and further casting Zenith Flare um, multiple times is just disgusting because these Zenith Flares um, are, again, your primary win condition. The amount of just junk you throw into the graveyard is is crazy. It, it adds up very quickly um, and you can just kill people outright, outright with the Zenith Flare. Um, but of course, you also have all these incidental creatures um, that come into play and can you can go wide, you can go big, you can attack your opponent from a different vector with the Draneth Stinger, and if it calls for the matchup, you can even gain some life. Uh, lastly, moving on to the lands, nothing special going on here, just a bunch of red-white dual lands, 20 total copies, just to ensure we have the right mana, but um, you really should have no problem, obviously, when every card in the deck is effectively a cantrip, it's just great inevitability of finding the Zenith Flares, finding the Mizx Masteries, and comboing out. If you run out of gas and run up against a lot of discard, again, you can recover by just drawing four cards in one shot with a boon of the Wishgiver in the graveyard and using Mizx Masteries. So it's so a lot, a lot of interesting angles and vectors of attack with this deck. It's a ton of fun just cycling through cards and just bombing your opponent with Zenith Flare. So I'm excited to take this out on the ladder. Maybe it'll flop a little bit. You know, it'll be a small sample size. But stay tuned to the next video. I will actually take this out on the ladder and uh, see if we can win some games and, and start uh, climbing uh, back to Mythic from Plat, I believe, is where we start now. Um, but anyways, guys, I'm Sai High. I hope you like the deck, um, the idea. Let me know what you think um, about it. Are there possible things I'm missing? Uh, one thing before I go, I should mention... Another route you could take this deck, you may notice I've got the art for Hollow One um, on the deck's, deck box. I actually took this out, um, but this is certainly a card that um, maybe makes more sense than the Magma Opus. Um, I'll have to be testing more for sure. Maybe we'll trim down that combo, trim the amount of Mizx Masteries, and make room for more Hollow Ones, because obviously Hollow One if you're not familiar, it has a ton of synergy here as well. Uh, five mana, four, four, but the interesting thing, of course, is that this spell costs two less to cast for each card you've cycled or discarded this turn, and it has cycling two as well. So, as you can imagine, um, you cycle a few cards, and suddenly this costs zero, um, and you have multiple in hand. Um, you can, quite early in the game, um, depending on how good your hand is, drop several hollow ones very early and just function as a very fast aggressive aggro deck um, but if that's not in your opening hand and doesn't work out that way it still has cycling um, so it's still you know not that big of a cost it still totally fits the synergy of the deck and of course hollow one was not a card that the standard archetype had access to so it may be that this just makes absolute sense in the deck I originally had it in. Um, I haven't done a ton of testing with this. I decided to take it out because I was more excited about just the this kind of trifecta, um, or maybe actually it's a four card, a uh, little bit of pseudo synergy combo we got going on here with the Mizx Master. I was just more excited about this. Um, just seemed more consistent to me than the Hollow One, but Hollow One could be very powerful in this deck, and maybe it is the right way to build this deck. Um, depending on what we're going for. But uh, honestly, like the Hollow One archetype, that's you can kind of get into a totally different archetype with that, um, where you're using like Faithless Lootings and stuff and discarding cards to cheat it into play faster that way. Um, but nevertheless, it maybe it does, in fact, make a ton of sense here. But um, I don't know. I'm rambling on. You guys, let me know what you think. Uh, maybe Hollow One makes more sense. Either way, I will test it out further. Um, and again, stay tuned for the next video. I will take this out on the ladder and see see what it can do. Hopefully, it can win some games or maybe it'll be a total flop. But either way, we'll have some fun testing it 
and see what it can do. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Again, I'm Sci High. Like and subscribe if you aren't already. And thank you for watching this far. Peace.